My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. I am but a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Basham encircle me. Roaring lions tearing their prey open, their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax, it has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. The second reading comes from Mark chapter 10, uh, verses 17 to 31, and can be found on page 1014 in the Bibles. Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had a great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, we have left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is the word of the Lord. And as we worship, build a throne. And I've sung that song for years. 
And it just struck me in a new way that as we worship, we're building a throne. And now Jesus has come and he's seated on his throne here and in our hearts. And here we are in his throne room waiting to hear what he wants to say to us. And um, he's going to use Janet this morning to do that. His word, as we've heard, is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. So there's something for everybody here. And we're going to go away having heard what Jesus has to say to us. Let's just pray for Janet. Thank you, Father, for Janet's um, willingness to serve you and the words that you have given her to speak to us this morning. Bless her, Lord, we pray, and open our hearts to hear what it is that you want to say to us. Amen. So it's great to come and be with you, and it's lovely to be here when it's been announced about your new vicar, and we look forward to uh, that. And I guess the reading we've just heard from Mark's Gospel is probably one that's familiar to most people. And yet I think there are still treasures and truths that should help and encourage us in our journey. So um, if you want to turn, somebody will tell me what page it was because I haven't got a church Bible open. 1014 if you want to uh, follow. And we find the rich young ruler coming to Jesus asking him what good thing he could do to inherit eternal life. But we know the truth is that there is no good thing that we can just do to inherit eternal life. The rich young ruler was a wealthy man and a young man. His eyes were set on religious matters. His eyes were set on teachers, eternal life, good deeds. It seems he had the look of a seeker. He seemed willing to listen, eager to learn. Lots of ticks in the disciple in the making form. He seemed to be a prime candidate to be a disciple in training. In fact, he'd almost got his NBQ. But the story has a dark end. It must have been quite a scene that day. Jesus was headed to Jerusalem to complete his assignment when suddenly this young man comes running towards him, kneels before him. As Jesus looked at this young man, he saw in him such promise and such potential. For he sees things in us, thank God, that no one else sees. He sees beyond our faults. He sees beyond our hang-ups. He sees beyond our flaws. He sees beyond our mask. He sees beyond our idiosyncrasies. He sees beyond our attitudes. What a message for us all. Surely a little nudge that we have to stop sizing up the people around us to see if they are worthy enough for us to witness to or to evangelize. We must allow the Holy Spirit to show us their potential, what and who they can become in Christ. The rich, young ruler comes running up to Jesus, probably expecting a pat on the back. If you look at verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. All going well. However, Matthew, Mark and Luke all tell us in the gospel that he went away sad. It's Matthew's account that tells us he was a young man. Luke tells us he was a ruler in the high religious class. Mark tells us he was rich. And that's why we refer to the story as the rich young ruler. But it's Mark who tells us that as Jesus looked at him, he loved him. He told him in that look that we can come as we are, but it's not how we enter, but how we leave that matters. You'd think at first glance this young man had everything. And I think that probably along his journey he'd already encountered Jesus and heard the rabbi teach on eternal life. I think this probably grew his curiosity. So it sounds as though he was excited again to see Jesus in view, and we're told he runs to him. And no matter where we are on our journey, there will come a point in our lives where we have to come running to Jesus. And if you haven't had that moment yet, it will come. Keep on living. That moment when you can't wait another hour, you can't wait another minute, you can't wait another second but you have to come running to Jesus. 
There's much in our story that makes it seem that this young man had it all together. But although he appeared to have himself all together, Jesus knew that there was something missing. It could be said he had much, yet he lacked everything. His life was full, but he was so empty. Yes, he had financial security by the sounds of it, but he was spiritually bankrupt. And so comes his question, what must I do to inherit eternal life, he asks. And we all know that Jesus has a way of dealing with us in an effort to help us focus on what's really important. You'd think at first that was a good question. Some of you know that I was a teacher before I was a vicar. And sometimes when children are somewhere on another bit of thing, you could say back to them, a good question. Brackets bubble in the air. Where did that come from? I was thinking about this. So this would, might go in the good question box. But what he wanted was something he could do that would receive a tick. Because we know that we can't do anything to inherit eternal life. We can get ourselves into the position to receive that inheritance. The young man knew eternal life existed. He knew he didn't have it. He knew he wanted it. And he'd come to the right person to receive it. Receive it. But when we encounter Jesus, it's not about how we come. It's about how we leave. This young man's sin was not against his brother or his sister. It was against God. Jesus asked him about the commandments, but he didn't ask him about the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. The rich young God ruler did have a God in his life, and that's God with a little g. And that's why Jesus asked him to go, sell all he had and give it to the poor and follow the Lord. Now we know that selling everything does not save a sinner. Giving to the poor does not save a sinner. Following Jesus of itself does not save a sinner, for that would be nothing more than religion. And we know what happened with Judas when he proved to us that religion does not save a soul. The young man had to understand faith. He had to accept and follow Jesus as his Lord and Saviour. Verse 21 says, Jesus loved him. Jesus knew that this young man had another God, yet still he loved him. But it seems at this time, the young man did not love Jesus in return. He loved something more than loving the Saviour. And it's Matthew's Gospel in chapter 10, verse 37, that reminds us, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son and daughter of, is more than me is not worthy of me. And love today is such a complicated thing. You can buy your pink heart cards all the time. You can buy your balloons. But I don't know that we sometimes understand love. Sometimes we're in love today and out of love tomorrow. Sometimes we confuse love with lust or with sex or with beauty or with assets. But Jesus must be the priority in our life. For when we really love the Lord, the rest of our relationships will fall into place. If I don't know how properly and fully to love the Lord, how can I properly and fully love you or you or you or you? We must love the Lord enough to be willing to get rid of all the little gods that occupy our lives. And we're told in our text that the man went away sad. So the note to ourselves must surely be, it's of course okay to come as we are. That's how God invites us. As long as we don't leave as we came. And it all starts with developing a love for Jesus. We come into church week after week. For some of us, it's a wonderful and important time. But for some, no change takes place because we kind of like Jesus and it's all right and we kind of follow him. It won't do. 
we each have to love Jesus as Jesus loves us. Jesus said to the man, you know the commandment, and with an air of disappointment, as if he expected Jesus to tell him something else, he responds, all these I have kept since I was a boy. You can almost hear the young man wondering what else he lacks. And Jesus didn't say, great, you've arrived. He didn't say, well done. Nor did he say you need more decency or more uprightness or more integrity or more courage or more reverence. His answer was to tell the young man to go and sell everything he has, not to give it away, but to sell it and then give. And I think if Jesus had been talking to Nicodemus instead of the rich young ruler, he would have said, get rid of your fear of the opinion of the Pharisees. Perhaps if he'd been talking to Herod, he would have said, put away your brother Philip's wife. If he'd been talking to King Agrippa, he might have said, instead of being almost persuaded, you should be fully persuaded to give your life to me. And perhaps if he'd been talking to Pontius Pilate instead of the rich young ruler, he would have said, stop washing your hands. Be washed in the blood of the Lamb, the Saviour. For it was riches that stood between the young ruler and Jesus. And just like most of us, the young man was unaware of his own faults. Suppose for a moment it was true that he had never broken the commandment Jesus listed supposing he had never murdered, even with his tongue, supposing he'd not committed adultery, even in his heart, supposing that he had never stolen or envied or spoken less than the whole truth. Did you notice in the list of commandments that Jesus talked to him about, they were the ones that dealt with person-to-person -person relationships, not the ones about God, the person. The young man had not have fulfilled those commandments. If he had, he would have immediately recognized Jesus as the Son of God. But it doesn't seem yet that he'd recognize the deity of Jesus. If we can't recognize Jesus, or won't, or don't, we will leave just as we came in. And the tragedy in our story today is that though the rich young man came to Jesus, he turned his back on him and went away sorrowful. He did not go out being in the presence of the Son of God. But is there a little bit of us that sometimes who we come in and go out in the same way? Every time you come to church, every time you're in the presence of the Lord, you should leave different. When we look in the Bible, when some people came to Jesus, some leave glad. If you look in Acts 3, you find the man at the gate called Beautiful. When some people come to Jesus, it's said that they leave mad. Think about Cain in Genesis 4. Some leave bad. It was the Pharisee and the publican in Luke 18. And some do leave sad when people turn their backs on Jesus and say no to him. They will always leave sad. In verse 22, we're told, he went away sad. That short sentence contains the tragedy of a soul. This young man holding his destiny in his hands, having the power to say yes or no turned his back on the saviour of our souls and refused to follow him. When Jesus answered his question, notice how suddenly his eagerness, his interest, his enthusiasm cools off because he had great wealth and lots of possessions. One minute, moment he's running courageously to meet Jesus and kneel at his feet. The next he slowly gets up and walks away carrying with him his fine gifts and his materialistic heart. He did not doubt Jesus knew the way to eternal life. He was just not willing to pay the price 
and had made that sudden discovery. He'd never imagined that his riches or his trust in riches stood between him and eternal life. It's one thing to be disappointed in others. It's another to be disappointed in yourself. Some of you will have heard people preach and say that Jesus failed because he did not win this young man. But I'd suggest it wasn't Jesus who failed, it was the young man. This is how I understand and define my calling. It's not to save anyone because I don't have any power. Power belongs to God. If Jesus did not save all those whom he encountered, what makes us think we're so gifted that everyone we encounter will come to Christ? Paul recognized, Apostle Paul recognized that there's a big difference between joining the church and joining the family of God. You'll remember that Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So I'd suggest it wasn't Jesus who failed this young man. It was the young man that failed in his decision. He'd been concerned to keep the commandments. Definitely a good thing. But he was more concerned to keep his cash. He bent his knee, but not his will. He bowed his head, but not his heart. He wanted heavenly treasures, but he couldn't give up earthly treasure. So we hear that the young man went away sadly and Jesus let him go. He didn't say, wait, come back, I'll compromise, I'll meet you halfway. The young man left the same way he came. I'm pretty sure he would have prayed a prayer if Jesus had given him one to pray. I'm sure he would have made a decision if Jesus had given him one to, ma to make. I'm sure he would have agreed to some terms if Jesus had given him some agreeable terms. But Jesus didn't give him a prayer. He didn't ask him to make a decision. He didn't call for a commitment. He stopped him dead in his tracks and Jesus' message was simple. Come as you are, but don't leave as you came. Maybe this is not the end of the story. Maybe the young man finished his grieving process and came back to Jesus, we don't know. Maybe he went through the five stages of grief. Denial when he's saying to himself, he can't mean this. Anger. Some of the disciples get to keep some of their stuff. I'm not giving away everything. Look at Zacchaeus. He only gave away half. And Jesus applauded him. That bargaining moment. How about I give away the beach house, but keep the one in the mountains? Depression. This is not working. Why do I feel so far away from life? And then, of course, that marvellous moment of acceptance. Okay, I'm letting it go. I'm letting it all go. I'm trusting in you. Let's go. The young man went away sad, for he was very rich. He had his eyes on the things of this world. He had his eyes on position and on popularity. The devil is a master painter and he can make the world look very attractive. But if you go that way, you will miss the thought of the Christ. So when we go today, let us remember the first commandment, the one Jesus didn't ask him about. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And then we'll find indeed that we can come as we are, but we won't leave as we came. Amen.